picture on the screen here. Uh, you know, we're the Central District Youth Convention, or is it convention or conference? I don't know. But uh, of Mennonite Brethren Churches. So who are the Mennonite Brethren, and how does that uh, affect you? All right? Well, this story actually begins way back in the 16th century during the Reformation. There were a group of radical believers who were reading the Bible for themselves. And as they were reading the Bible, they began to realize, you know what? It's not the authority of the priest or church tradition that dictates my faith. It's God's Word and Jesus Christ Himself. And as they read the Scriptures, they didn't see anywhere where it said that we needed to be baptized as, as infants. In fact, all the uh, indicators in the Gospels were that people were baptized as believers. They were old enough to understand what they believed, and they were baptized, and it was called believer's baptism. And so, um, so these... Three men, interesting names, Conrad Grable, George Blaurock, and Felix Mons, gathered together on a cold January morning in the river Limat in Zurich, Switzerland, and they baptized each other as believers. They had already been baptized as infants, but they thought, that doesn't count. I didn't know what was going on. So they were baptized again, and that's what Anabaptist means. It's not anti-Baptist, it's Anabaptist, to be re-baptized or to be baptized again. Well, this was considered treason uh, against the church, against the government, and the church acted a lot like the government then. And so uh, they were uh, arrested. In fact, uh, Felix Montz, um, one of the first recorded martyrs in this era was um, actually taken back to the same river to be drowned. And while they were binding his, his hands behind his legs, and they were going to put a post between his legs and drop him into the water, the priest gave him one more opportunity to recant. And as he looked up on the shoreline, his mother, sister, and brother were there. And they held up their fingers like this. And they said, stay true to Christ. Stay true to Christ. So this became the symbol among the Anabaptists. To stay true to Christ. And they threw him in the river. And he drowned. Well, that didn't stop the Anabaptist movement. It began to grow and to flourish. And so what happened was... Uh, since this was illegal, they were hunted down and persecuted. Many people were drowned, and others were burned at the stake. But the, the movement continued to grow because while people were being burned at the stake, they would pray, they would praise God, they would sing hymns, they would even witness to the onlookers. People were coming to Christ as they were watching these martyrs being burned at the stake. And so someone invented tongue screws that they would put in their mouths to screw down their tongue so they couldn't even witness while they were being burned at the stake. Well, this went on for many years. And during this time, there was a former Catholic priest named Menno Simons who, um, as he was reading the scriptures and hearing about these Anabaptists, he became sympathetic to who they were and what they believed, what they stood for. So he began to teach and to preach and to write. And the people who uh, heard him speak, people who read his writings, were derisively called Mennonites, little Mennos. Uh, one of his famous quotations was called, True Evangelical Faith Cannot Lie Dormant, Cannot Lie Sleeping clothes the naked, feeds the hungry, and becomes all things to all people. Well, he too was, uh, you know, uh, living in hiding. Ironically, he was never uh, martyred. But what happened is this persecution continued until uh, Tsar Catherine the Great in Russia 
heard about these Anabaptists. They had a history of being good farmers. She had some land near the Black Sea by the Neckar River in the Ukraine that she thought could be reclaimed and, and become fruitful. So she invited these uh, Mennonites to that area to reclaim that land. And the deal was no more persecution. The Russians will leave you alone. You can worship your God however you want. You don't have to join the military either. So they took her up on the deal. They moved to that area, started working the land. The first uh, generation or so was brutal. Disease, death. But after a while, things turned around and uh, life became really, really good for the next hundred years or so. In fact, they would call this the golden age of the Mennonites back in the colonies in Russia. Around 1860, uh, maybe I should say this, that while the, there was economic increase, at the same time there was spiritual decline. The people were beginning to forget uh, living by the scriptures, following Jesus. And, and uh, there were some Lutheran ministers, uh, traveling evangelists in the area. And some of them began to listen to those uh, evangelists and they were saying, you know what? We need to live by the Holy Spirit. We need to follow the scriptures again. And there was a group of 17 men and their families that seceded from the Mennonites and they were derisively called the Brethren. Okay? And so this is where we get the, the term Mennonite Brethren. Well, along that time, uh, by 1870s, uh, another migration happened. People looking for a better life, they moved to North America. Uh, and that migration lasted about 10 years. Some 10,000 Mennonites and Mennonite brethren moved across to North America. And of course, they moved to agricultural areas because they were farmers. So they moved to places like Kansas and Nebraska and South and North Dakota and and uh, Oklahoma, then there was a later migration out to some uh, agricultural areas in California, in Oregon. Okay? They were farmers, and that's how we, as men and my brethren, got here. But what are some things that MBs believe, and who are we? Well, many would say we're the people of the book, the Bible, that we want to radically follow what God teaches us in Scripture. So we talk about the obedience of faith, that we come to know Christ as we obey Christ. And we don't get to know Christ without obeying Christ. And if we don't obey, we won't know Christ. We talk about loving our enemies. When Jesus, who we believe is God's Son, says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And since Jesus is God's Son and He meant what He said, we need to take that seriously. What does that mean for us in our lives? Following Christ in love and compassion to the world around us. And of course, we take the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We take that Great Commission seriously. So we talk about following Jesus as the heart of discipleship. Following in Jesus' footsteps. That means we come to Christ in personal faith. But that leads us, that's a doorway into a life of discipleship. We live for Christ, carry the cross every day. We believe in the authority of Scripture. It's the authority, it's our playbook for our lives. And yet, we, it's not just me who interprets it, or Brad, or a teacher. We come to understand the Scriptures together. We work out our understanding together. But we also want to proclaim, proclaim the Gospel, both in word and in deed. So as Mennonite brethren, we kind of lead the way in mission work, in compassion and service work around the world. We're a mission-minded people. So that means we're actually a pretty small denomination, but we have more Mennonite Brethren Christians in India than we do in all of North America. More MB Christians in Africa than we do in all of North America. And Stacy and Sandy working with MB Mission, going to the least reach, that is still a, a passion of ours as a people. We also work in, in service work around the world with Mennonite Central Committee. And if you heard the, the 
There was a famine in Somalia and the Sudan and around the Horn of Africa. MCC is there doing uh, work for the, the people in need. So I just want to say this, that this was a brief Reader's Digest version of the MV story. It's a story of a, a radical people who wanted to radically follow Christ and obey the scriptures. It's a people who want to reach out in the world and be Christ in the world, world in word and in deed. That's the MV story, but you know what? You're here, so you have the opportunity to make it your story. And this is part of God's bigger story. So I want to invite you to jump into the story.